Welcome to You Are What Your Food Ate, Part 2, Eat Clean, Get Healthy. Everything we've been taught about healthy eating is wrong with Jimmy and Janet Langkop. What am I talking about? Being a clean fooditarian. It's just a name. What is a clean fooditarian? Eat clean food only. Yeah, but what does that mean? Eliminate the bad carbs, fats, and proteins, and increase the good fats, proteins, and carbs. Okay. We want to eliminate the bad stuff and increase the good stuff. That's pretty simple. But Jimmy, what is that? What does that look like? What does clean food really look like? Well, let's take a look here. What we're gonna talk about is going back to where we separated things out and let's, let's be a little bit more specific about what is the toxic feedlot to hospital model. The ones things that you want to avoid and there's scientific reason behind every one of these. First thing is we're gonna use the pyramid the first thing you've got to eliminate from your diet, I've eliminated from mine, Janet has from hers, and it has been huge. It's the hardest one for us to eliminate. It's our biggest single addiction. It's the biggest single killer in our diet. If you only eliminated this one thing, it would change your health tremendously. What is it? Sugar, you bet, in any of its forms, okay? Sugar, because sugar ends up creating obesity, Inflammation, and inflammation in our body is the mother of all the diseases, diabetes, heart disease, liver disease, and addiction because sugar is highly addictive. This is why the food processing giants use sugar and all kinds of sugars, particularly high fructose corn syrup, because it's so addictive and they put it in everything to make you come back for more. We use stevia because it's natural. You get some sweetener out of it, but it's natural. It doesn't spike your blood sugar like other stuff does. It's, it's good to cook with. And if you want to use it for flavoring, use stevia. But here's something that we learned also. Whenever you start getting a sugar craving, eat fat. Eat some fat. You eat fat, and that sugar craving will go away, and that fat will keep you satiated for hours that you've eaten. It might be a handful of macadamia nuts, almonds. Macadamia nuts are fabulous. They're the fattiest. That's our favorite is macadamia nuts. And boy, it just stops the hunger right away. Coconut oil. Well, how many of y'all want to eat butter straight out of a container? If it's grass-fed butter, you could, and that'll stop that sugar cravings. Yeah. Sugar is our most expensive food. 30 to 40% of our health care expenditures are related to sugar consumption in this country, and we spend over a trillion dollars a year fighting the effects of too much sugar in our bodies. Pretty expensive. How does sugar kill us? Okay, two things happen. Sugar is it gets in our bloodstream. Remember, we put it in when we ate, and the door goes up, insulin rises. And when we get a lot of sugar in our bloodstream, and it merges with fat, which is supposed to be there, our fats, this causes something known as triglycerides. And triglycerides are a predictor of heart disease. So sugar plus fat is a predictor of heart disease. What about sugar when it bonds with protein? Something else is supposed to be in our bloodstream. When it bonds with protein, it's called glycation, and that is a predictor of oxidation in our brain and brain diseases. Oxidation is not a good thing. That's inflammation in our brain. Dr. Robert Lustig is one of our great heroes. He did a video that went viral, and it was an academic lecture video called Sugar, the Bitter Truth. And he's become a rock star over this, and he's one of our real heroes, and I'll explain why a little later. He exposes the real truth about sugar, and he put all the science in this, this talk, and it went viral. It's amazing. Now, here he is, and there's a picture of him. He's a pediatric endocrinologist, and he really specializes in childhood obesity. He's fighting what happens with kids every day. Now, I'll just tell you about something about Dr. Lustig and why he's Janet and my personal hero. Dr. Lustig is just brilliant what he does. But he says, I gotta fight the root cause of this childhood obesity. He's gone back to law school, he's getting, got a law degree, because he's going to sue all the big uh, processed food giants. Sue them for all the sugar that's in there that's causing childhood obesity. He realizes <clears throat> that the only way to change this is through the courts and through political action and not, a, not wait on Congress. No, no, they're bought off by big money. Forget about that. He's gonna do it the only way he knows how to do it. He's become a lawyer now too. He's just graduated. You're gonna see a lot more of Dr. Lustig. Uh, he's a giant and he's so friggin' courageous. 
Here's a book of his, Fat Chance, Beating the Odds Against Sugar, Processed Food, Obesity, and Disease. It's brilliant. It's great. Now, here's a cute little thing about why sugar's killing us. Pretty much everyone likes the sweet, sweet taste of sugar. But now some scientists are saying sugar is toxic. Really, scientists? Couldn't you have just looked the other way on this one? We all know that sugar isn't the healthiest thing. But it's not dangerous, right? Well, it turns out that it totally can be. Here's a sad statistic. For the first time in history, U.S. children are not expected to live longer than their parents. Why? A lot of it has to do with the fact that cases of obesity, type 2 diabetes, and heart disease are through the roof. There's another sad statistic. Today, one out of every three U.S. adults is obese. Not overweight. Obese. One in three. But what does this have to do with sugar? Sugar's been around forever, so why is it suddenly making us so sick? What changed? What changed is we dramatically increased the amount of fructose we consume. Fructose is the sweet stuff that's in sugar, and high fructose corn syrup, sugar's newer and cheaper twin. Fructose can do damage to your body in ways we are just beginning to understand. What kind of damage? Let's start with the nerdiest part of the body, the brain. Just recently, scientists discovered a hormone called leptin. Leptin's job is to tell your brain that your body's had enough to eat. Guess what gets in the way of that job? Sugar. When you indulge in soft drinks and junk food, your brain has a hard time recognizing leptin, so you stay hungry longer and eat more than you should. This causes problems with your pancreas. Your pancreas produces insulin, which helps regulate your blood sugar. The more sugar you have in your bloodstream, the harder your pancreas has to work. And an overworked pancreas can lead to bad things. Obesity, metabolic syndrome, and type 2 diabetes. And when you consider heart disease and liver disease, both of which can be caused by sugar, then yeah, sugar is bad. Okay cut down on the sweets, right? Not as easy as it sounds. High fructose corn syrup is now added to foods that never had sugar before, food you wouldn't expect. In fact, a recent study found that 80% of the food items in America now contain added sugar, 80%. But like a good raincoat, this trend is reversible. Educated consumers can change the way food is manufactured simply by making better choices. Food companies only make what we buy, right? So avoiding food and drinks with added sugar will force the food industry to produce healthier food and stop adding sugar. But we have to start now, because sugar is killing us. Isn't that a great little video? Go to Facebook.com, sugar is killing us, tell them how much you love their video. It's uh, just brilliant. Our bodies are not evolutionarily adapted to eat sugar, not this much sugar. Why? It takes usually 40,000 years for our body to adapt to a new food. 40,000 years. And sugar is relatively new, starts with a big time with the Dutch in the 1700s, in 1700s, in, in, in trading in sugar and importing sugar. Sugar is out of control in our bodies and that's why we are having so many diseases and our bodies breaking down because our bodies are not combustion engines. You just cannot put anything in it. We think we can, but we can't. The next thing we've got to eliminate on this toxic feedlot, the hospital model, are processed foods, fast foods, flour foods, canned foods, box foods, and packaged foods. Maybe the only exception to canned foods would be canned tomatoes because they're actually very good. Tomato paste, that's pretty much there's not too many canned things you can do and start reading the ingredients on everything. If you can't pronounce it, why would you put it in your body? Your body's not gonna know what to do with it if your brain doesn't. We wanna get rid of processed foods our diet because that's the second biggest contributor to being overweight and to being sick and dying early, right here. And particularly when you get in here, we're really getting into the stuff that's gonna damage our brain an awful lot. That means all breads, bakery goods, wheat, pasta, refined carbohydrates, cereal, crackers, chips, juices. Yes, I said juices. Why would you, why would juices be in there? I think they're, I thought they were healthy. No, 
You might as well have a Coca-Cola. I mean, a real classic, fully high octane, fully leaded, sugar inducing, coma, coma inducing sugar based Coca-Cola because it's the same thing in your body. It's going to do this. It's going to close the door of insulin and you're not going to burn fat and you're going to be burning sugar and then you're going to be in a carbohydrate cycle. These are all fast carbs. Eat the fruit, don't drink the juice. You want the fiber attached with it. We have corn in everything. That's in every processed food you find on, in the supermarket. It's, it's just ubiquitous. Much of our weight gain is from all these corn products in finding the ways into products. What is corn doing in your shampoo? What is corn doing in our bread? Corn, what is it doing in our ice cream? What's it doing in our cookies? What's it doing in everything? What's it doing in our spaghetti sauces? It's there. And one of the biggest, saddest things that we have going on in our country right now, and this is part of the political aspect, we subsidize Happy Meals because everything you buy at McDonald's has got corn in it. We're subsidizing every piece of corn there is, and we're making everything cheaper, cheap food, which is destroying our health. We subsidize Happy Meals, but we don't subsidize healthy meals. I think our values are backwards. I think we need to remember that. Our bodies are not evolutionarily adapted to eat processed foods. Why? Our bodies are not combustion engines. Next on the list here, what we want to eliminate are GMOs. I know y'all are familiar, you've heard GMOs, genetically modified organisms. That means they have been altered. That means they're not natural. They're frankenfoods. What do we do with genetically modified foods? They're engineered to withstand weed killers. Hmm, okay, weed killer, Monsanto, Agent Orange. Ever heard of these? Those are, that was a weed killer. Monsanto is creating that, and in the genetically modified foods, it's able to withstand Roundup, which is Agent Orange Light. Roundup is a weed killer. Do you want to eat something that you could have a toxic pesticide sprayed on it, that that plant could withstand it? And not only would it withstand it, it's going to have a pesticide in it, in that corn, so when the bug comes and eats that corn, what does it do? That bug's belly explodes, gets ripped open, swells up and gets ripped open. Well, that's what it does to ours too. Those pesticides that are in Roundup Ready corn, soy, canola, they're toxic to our body. So avoid corn, soy, canola, sugar beets, squash, zucchini, Wheat, because wheat has, has been modified too, unless any of those are organic. Guess what? Good luck if you can find organic versions of any of those. They're hard to find. But if you can, go for it. Otherwise, avoid them. Now, I put in here, eat or drink no feedlot or factory farm animal fed antibiotics or GMOs. Because every one of those animals is toxic. Whatever they produce, whether it's their milk, the butter, the cheese, or the meat is toxic to our bodies. Our bodies cannot metabolize it well. So if you're eating anything out there on the street, you're eating industrial mood. You're eating at any fast food restaurant except for Chipotle, because Chipotle's business model is based on and grass-fed beef, pastured pork, and free-range chicken. They buy locally. They buy the cleanest meats there are. It's the only place Janet and I will eat out is at Chipotle for that very reason, and that's also why their stock is $500 a share, just like Apple Computer, because they, are, they figured this out a long time ago, and that is they had the same integrity that Apple had under Steve Jobs about building the highest quality product, and that's what Chipotle has delivered. So eat or drink, no factory farm animal food. You don't want the, you don't want the antibiotics that are in them, because the antibiotics in those animals go into us, and that's why we're becoming antibiotic resistant. GMOs, 60 to 70% of all processed food has GMOs. 70% of all food in the supermarket has GMOs. Where do you not find GMOs? On the perimeter, where the produce is, the meat is. But you can find it in some of the meat. Matter of fact, most of the meat's gonna have GMOs in it, unless you know it's grass-fed. Beef, pastured pork, or free-range chicken, those won't. Anything else will because they'll all have GMO corn in them. 90% of all corn is genetically modified, 88% of which goes to industrial animals. So you think you're being good by buying organic corn? Great. You eat processed meat? Bingo. You just ate GMOs. 
94% of all soy is genetically modified. 90% of all cotton is genetically modified. Now, why would we worry about cotton? That's something we wear. Guess what? It's mixed in food for animals and feedlots. Why would you be putting cotton in food? Is that a natural thing? No, but it's an awfully good filler. It's mixed into industrial animal feed and processed food. Cotton, wow. 90% of all canola is genetically modified. My biggest complaint when you buy products at Whole Foods while we shop there, you've got to be careful. You can't just buy everything there because they use canola oil in everything that they make there. Their, their, their tuna fish, their macaroni salads, it'll all have canola oil in it. And it shouldn't be. They should know better. And now they do lead the way on some things because they're ending all genetically modified foods in their, uh, in their business model. And I applaud them for that. But they need to get canola, canola out of their recipes right now. This is what we want to do. We want to stop Agent Orange corn. We want to stop it from ever getting in our body. Because what if we stop consuming it and we stop consuming the animals that consume it? That'll change the model. Here's another thing about GMOs. 40% of milk and dairy in the U.S. Can, contain something called RGBH. Now, what is RGBH? Recombinant bovine growth hormone. It's banned in humans where? In the European Union? Wow, why would they ban it? Where else? Canada has banned it, Australia has banned it, and so has New Zealand. But we haven't banned it, it's okay for us, but it's not for anybody in the European Union. 40% of all milk and dairy in the U.S. contains this. Now that's in addition to the GMOs that they were fed. Highly, highly toxic. Our bodies are not evolutionarily adapted to eat GMOs, because why? Our bodies are not combustion engines. What else can we find that we don't want to be putting in our body? Oh my gosh, this is a really hard one for a lot of us to deal with. And I struggled with this just intellectually. I said, how could this possibly be? But then as I was listening to Sean Croxton in some of his podcasts, and I was just challenged by him, I said, I'm going to do this. He will not take on a client who eats grains, no matter what. He will not. If so, he, he says, you've got to be grain-free for 30 days before I'll work with you now. Grain-free for 30 days. That's pretty stiff. But I have so much respect for who, what he says. I did it, and boy, did I notice a difference right away. Now, I'm a cookie monster. Chocolate chip cookies, oh, yum, yum. Yeah, I was always been a cookie monster. And, you know, but boy, I did it. And it, it, it you just feel the inflammation. You, you don't even realize you're inflamed. You just feel a swollenness leave your body. So grains and legumes, you want it, which is wheat, rice, corn. All right, beans. Beans, how could beans, those are legumes. How could beans be bad for you? They're told they're really good for us, they're healthy. How many of y'all ever get gas eating beans? <laughs> Do you think it's your body telling you that it might be toxic? You know? No, yes, there's a natural reaction that goes on there by, so people take beano, no, no. Do no beans, not beano. One of the reasons why uh, beans, soy, and peanuts are really dangerous for us, as well as wheat, rice, corn, they all have something called lectin, L-E-C-T-I-N in them. It's a natural pesticide to ward off predators to make predators sick. And it, again, it messes with the intestinal linings of the predators. Well, we have something like that going on. We, we hear about an awful lot called celiac disease or leaky gut or autoimmune disorders. All of that comes from eating grains. What do grains do? They're toxic to us, they will inflame us, they will cause leaky gut, they'll cause depression, anxiety, moodiness, ADHD, Alzheimer's, dementia, and on top of that, they'll fatten us. Corn is designed to fatten up cows, animals. In Europe, I know I went and lived there for a year, went to the University of Madrid, I was shocked to find out nobody in Europe eats corn. I lived in Spain, and they told me, but my Spanish family says, well, that's only for animals but they don't even feed the animals in Spain corn. Now the English love corn and about 200 years ago, 250 years ago, the English would want to get our beef and the, but they wanted, it to, they wanted it to be very fat. So they would ask to have corn fed, but this is not GMO corn, this was natural corn, corn be put in the diet to help fat enough the, the cattle when they sent the beef over to them. So yes, we've been doing that for a little while, but not very much, just to make it fatter. But what we've done right now is that we're feeding, we're taking all of our cows 
and taking them off their natural diet, which is grass, and giving them a corn-based diet mixed in with cotton and other things and soy, canola. And yes, we're fattening them up in half the time. They get them to slaughter in half the time. But guess what happens? From them eating th that corn, those same cows will die within 30 days to no more than 90 days of their, when they were slaughtered, if they were left to live naturally. Because why? They all have their own leaky guts. Corn is, rips apart a cow's intestinal lining. Cow has four stomachs to ferment grasses, to break down and ferment grasses, okay? And those stomachs are getting ripped apart, but they get them to slaughter quicker, great profits, cheaper meat. We don't want to eat cheap food. Buy the expensive stuff. Now, I'm putting these in the order of the things to try and eliminate from your diet. Do I say, go out and do all this right now? That's up to you. At least to take them in this order. Try for 30 days and see what happens, see if you don't notice a difference. And maybe you're just fine. I just want to share with you what we know is the truth from medical science and research right now and the most cutting edge doctors. Here's something Hippocrates says, all disease begins in the gut. This is really important. All disease begins in the gut. And then it goes to the rest of your body. Wheat belly. Dr. William Davis wrote a fabulous bestseller, and it tells about the, the problem with grains, and here is Dr. Davis talking. What we have today called wheat is not what we think of. That is this four and a half, five foot tall plant that stands up to your shoulders and a grown adult. It is a two foot tall, short, stocky plant that has a very large seed head, a very thick stalk, but yields about tenfold more per acre. So this was introduced in the 70s. It caught on gradually. Many farmers, by the way, thought this thing looked weird and didn't want to grow it in the late 70s. But once they saw the incredible increase in yield, they rapidly embraced it in the early 80s, such that by 1985, when you went to the grocery store and bought bread, cookies, cakes, pretzels, crackers, anything made of wheat, virtually all of it came from this high yield, semi-dwarf strain. Okay, so today's wheat isn't the same as your grandmother's wheat. So what? You cannot change a plant to this incredible degree, often using bizarre and extreme techniques, without changing its underlying genetics and biochemistry. We know that multiple proteins in wheat, the gliadin proteins, the gluten proteins, uh, the lectin proteins, probably the glutenin proteins, the whole long list of new proteins that are just different perhaps by a few amino acids, but as any allergist will tell you, it just takes a shift of a couple, three, a handful of amino acids in a protein, and it can make a difference between no reaction and a fatal reaction. So we know that there have been extensive changes introduced into the wheat plant. Now we're seeing the downstream consequence. We're seeing this incredible surge in diseases. Uh, and I wouldn't have even thought to put two and two together until we saw what happened we took wheat out of the diet. When I stopped eating wheat and other grains, I waved goodbye to several annoying health problems. That's what happens, and more. Now that book became a bestseller, New York Times list, and has been a, you know, a top seller for two years now. Here's one that just came out in September, absolutely brilliant book. He's, this is a functional medicine doctor, one of the world's leading neurologists, Dr. David Perlmutter, Grain Brain, the surprising truth about wheat, carbs, and sugar, your brain's silent killers. Dr. Davis is talking about what, they, what grains do to our bellies, to our stomachs, and now this is what's going on in our brains. Now guess what? There's no pain receptors in our brain, none. So you can have an inflamed brain and you don't know it. You don't have any signs of it. But one day, you wake up and you start forgetting things. How many of us have had a parent or relative that we've seen come down with dementia, Alzheimer's, the loss of memory, and just losing their faculties? I think we all are affected with that. Well, guess what? That's our future. That's our future unless we can do exactly what Dr. Perlmutter says. He says Alzheimer's dementia is completely preventable completely preventable. Right now, he's not saying it's reversible if you have it. 
But by changing your diet and getting the weed out, and people have seen this, and Dr. Carpenter can probably talk about this as well, within 30 days, within 30 days, people, their symptoms and acting out stuff starts to go away and sometimes completely gone. Kids with ADHD, they're on Ritalin, they're bouncing all over the place. Get the grain out of their diets and it changes everything. Does this everybody? No, but it does work a lot of places. Sometimes it might be a little bit longer. This book is absolutely brilliant to read about the effects this has on the brain. What is our single most important organ in our body? Well, our heart. But if you don't have your brain, your heart can tick and you can't communicate with anybody and you're, you become a prisoner. You become a prisoner in your own body if we jeopardize our brain health. So all of them are important. But we can't afford to jeopardize this because, you know what, I don't believe we're afraid to die. I think we're afraid of how we die. And I don't think any one of us wants to die in a nursing home or wants to die as an Alzheimer's patient that doesn't remember your own family. That's a fate much worse than death as far as I'm concerned. That's a prisoner in your own body. And the food that we have is what compromises our brains. What does Grain Brain talk about? I'm going to sum up Grain Brain in nine words. He says, cut out the sugar for your brain health. He says, cut out the gluten, which is wheat and the protein that's in gluten. And all, because most everybody has a gluten sensitivity. We just don't know it yet. Nobody should be eating gluten. Dr. Fasano of Harvard University says that everybody has a sensitivity to gluten and nobody should be eating gluten. Nobody, nobody, nobody should be eating gluten, period. And eat more fat. I, my apologies for taking such a fabulous book and just reducing it to nine words, but that's the basic message you get out of that. Cut out the sugar, cut out the gluten, and eat more fat. For brain health, eat more fat. Everything I'm telling you is, I didn't create this, I, I'm just plagiarizing. I'm just borrowing from the, gr the great minds of what they've said and put it into a single story. And I did it just for Janet's and my health of what we needed to do to navigate this world out there. Here's a picture of an MRI from Grain Brain. And if you will notice right here, this one with a gluten sensitive brain, this is normal brain over here. Look what happens, what's going on over here where you have gluten sensitivity going on in the brain. Does that look as healthy? No. Actually, those are cells, those are brain cells, brain areas that are vacant, dead. We're killing them off. Is that what we want to do? That's what this food is doing to us if we don't stop and change it. Grains, refined or not, increase appetite. Grains cause gut inflammation and brain inflammation, both and they will cause leaky gut. We haven't heard of leaky brain yet, but what is leaky brain? That's what we have going on with these neurological diseases. Grains compromise our immune system. Why is that important? Because that's in our gut. Because when you take your immune system down, then you can catch flus and colds and everything else, and you're just a, you're just a host for problems coming your way. We have to keep our immune system strong. So, our bodies are not evolutionarily adapted to eat grains and legumes because they're not combustion engines. Now, what else could there be? We have, we've covered quite a bit. Well, guess what? Every one of these things we have listed here, we would call sugar carbs. These are the carbohydrates that cause us all the problems. They all become sugar fast in our body. So the sugar carbs. But what else is there? Let's take a look. Industrial proteins and fats. The last thing that we want to eliminate from our diet, the feedlot, our factory farm beef, pork, chicken, fish, and dairy. That means the ice cream that we get from there, the milk that we get from them, the yogurt, the cheese, the eggs, the butter, and the margarine that we get from industrial animals is all harmful to us. It's all toxic to us. And the franken fats that have been created from the industrial model, such as the corn oil, the canola oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, all of those are franken fats. They're high in omega-6s, which cause inflammation in our body. They actually fry like french fries, our arteries. Do you want to see what causes the plaque damage in your arteries? Eat some corn oil, vegetable oil. Eat some hydrogenate oils. Those are the ones. So you want to avoid all the corn, vegetable, canola, soybean, sunflower, uh, oil, safflower, hydrogenate oils, and trans fats. 
because that is the stuff that is hurting us. Mom always said, you are what you eat. Well, here's what we're doing, factory farm cows. What are we giving them? GMO corn, soy, alfalfa, and cotton. Now, how many of those do you think are natural to a cow's diet? Maybe alfalfa because it's a grass. But cows are meant to eat grass, not corn, not soy, not canola. We want our cows high on grass, not high on corn. Our cows are not meant to eat any of those things, only grass. Anything other than grass starts to destroy a cow's stomach and changes the lipid profile of the meat, the quality of the meat. And it actually becomes toxic for us. Here's the big thing. Drug makers are not making antibiotics. They're starting to quit making them because they're useless for us now. One, there was a frontline report that came out in November about this called Hunting the Nightmare Bacteria. And they said, well, we've been overprescribing uh, antibiotics from doctors, so we're breaking down our immune system. What they didn't say in this report, and it's the first thing Jen and I noticed, he says, well, hold it. That's not the real problem. The real problem is all the antibiotics that's in the food that we're eating. That's what's causing so much antibiotic resistance in our bodies. Now, what we do realize in March, they're supposed to be coming out with part two around this, talking about the antibiotics in our foods. 70% of all antibiotics made in this country go to feedlot animals. 70%. So you don't think you're not getting a heavy dose of antibiotics and why you would be antibiotic resistant? Because you're ingesting that much. Antibiotics kill off good gut bacteria while it's going after all the bad stuff. It's killing off a lot of good stuff in the process. It's not worth it. Our system is being compromised from too many antibiotics. So what is that left for us to eat? Not a lot, right? We're not evolutionarily adapted to eat any of these foods because our bodies are not combustion engines. Here's what happens when you start to eat these foods. You get inflammation, right? And what does inflammation do? Well, this is something Dr. Perlmutter talks about. It creates free radicals in our body. And what does that end up doing? Creating the death of brain cells. And what does that do? It creates neurological diseases. All starts from inflammation of these foods. Now, what else does this do? That's kind of the model. Well, it, here's what comes out of inflammation in our body. Obesity. And then diabetes, di which is diabetes type 2. Alzheimer's, which is called di uh, diabetes type 3. Neurological diseases, cardiovascular diseases, pulmonary diseases, autoimmune diseases, arthritis, and cancer. All of that comes from inflammation from the foods we're eating. We didn't have these diseases 100 years ago. It's been the introduction of these modern foods that our body doesn't know what to do with that is the primary cause, not the only cause, but the primary cause, the biggest single culprit, is in our food. Our food can kill us slowly, or our food can cure us fast. By what we put in our mouth changes everything. So what, what do we want to do to reduce inflammation? There's, there's certain foods that are inflammatory, not for everybody. Some people are going to have some type of reactivity to some of these and not all of them. But here are the main culprits. Sugar, wheat, gluten, corn we have in there, soy, peanuts, beans, dairy, and eggs, and coffee. Now, the best way I know to do this, and this is something Dr. Carpenter has done for both Janet and I, is do a blood test to see what we're reactive to. And then when something that your body cannot tolerate that is sensitive to, just eliminate it. Just completely eliminate it. What else can you do to reduce inflammation? Eat more vegetables, some fruits, a lot more omega-3s, fish oil, cod liver oil, cacao butter is good for that. Take probiotics, drink more water. Exercise will reduce inflammation. Any type of relaxation or meditation or visualization will reduce inflammation. And sleep uh, will also reduce inflammation. So what do we really want to do? Right down here at the bottom. Eat Mother Nature's food, whole and nutritious, cut out the man-made foods. Now, we got another chart to look at. So to make it real simple, because this is the roadmap, I'm just explaining it because I, I care that you all have the consciousness to understand why you do this, not just what to do. Because if you know the why, it'll be real easy to implement it. You won't have to be guessing. So let's go over this other part right here about the healthy body fuel and meds part.
and I'll go through this pretty fast. You want to eat all the colorful fresh vegetables you possibly can and some fruits too. But fruits, you don't need a lot of them because they're real high in sugar. So you want your lower sugar ones, your berries, your northern fruits, as opposed to your southern fruits. But you can have the southern ones too, but you don't need a lot of them. You want to trade your grains for your greens. Green veggies have the highest micronutrients. Fermented foods like sauerkraut are great for you or something called kimchi. That's really good for your gut bacteria and your digestion. The thinner the skin, go organic, because why? You are what your food ate. You don't want to eat those pesticides. You don't want to eat that other stuff that's on there. Uh, eat the fruit, not the juice. Why? Because nature is really smart. It always attached a fiber to the sugar, to the fructose, and you want that fiber to help pull it out of your body. And if you just drink the juice, you're just getting the sugar rush. You're getting the worst part of it. Also, you really want to eat your slow carbs, and these are your slow carbs, and those are really great. This is where your prebiotics are in the green vegetables. You can't have enough of those. Half to two thirds of your plate should be covered in these wonderful vegetables because that's where so much of your medicine is right there. How do you know if it's organic? Well, this is a pretty good sign right there. You see this? Certified organic, 100%. That's good, that's safe. Anything there, load up on. That's, your, that's, where your, that's your best pharmacy right there. That's where your best meds are. How do you know if something's organic if it's not labeled? See this right here, this first one? If it's four digits, it's not organic, okay? The only ones that are organic will have five digits and will begin with this number nine. That's how you can know something is organic. Five digits on your produce beginning with the number nine. Look for that. Buy it, it's worth it, because you're worth it. So here it is again. Right there, see the four digits, not organic, and here's the organic bell peppers, five digits with beginning with a nine. Let's talk about natural grass. Let's talk about the proteins that we're supposed to eat. This is one of the inconvenient truths for me when I was trying to be a vegan. By the way, being vegan and vegetarian helped me gain a lot of weight. I didn't get a lot healthier, but I, at least I was ethically doing what I thought was the right thing. But I didn't realize some very important things that I learned from John Wood of US Wellness Meats. We are natural carnivores. We have a GI tract, gastrointestinal tract, that is, that is exactly what is designed to be carnivorous. We secrete hydrochloric acid in our gut in order to break down the protein that we eat, to disinfect the food that we have in us, and also to break down animal protein. Well, that's not by accident. B12 is absolutely essential to the human body. B12, you cannot get B12 any place but animal products. Herbivores, cows, have to constantly eat, all day long, constantly, and they have multiple stomachs to break down the grasses and then to ferment the grasses, and the protein that they are become great for humans. They eat the grass for us, we eat them. That's the way we're designed. Like it or not, it doesn't matter what your belief systems are, that's the way we're designed. How do you tell if it's grass-fed beef? Well, let's see, right there on the label. Make sure it says grass-fed. If it doesn't say grass-fed, 100% grass-fed, not just grass-fed's not good enough. 100% grass-fed has to be on the labels here, okay? So if it doesn't have to say grass-fed, do we see grass-fed anywhere here? Here's one from Natural Grocers. It says 100% grass-fed, that's what we want. What about this one over here? It says organic pasture-raised. Is that good enough? No. No, it's not. We don't want organic corn. No, we want 100% grass-fed, which we look right next to it is right there. Worry about your butter. Here's Kerrygold from grass-fed cows. This is Kelowna Supernatural Cottage Cheese. It's grass-fed. That's the kind of things we want to look for in the grocery store. You want to see your chickens to be where it says down here, free range, or it can say pasture roaming. In other words, we don't want them in an inside facility, cage free is not good enough. Free range, we want them out there on the pasture. Chickens are meant to eat bugs and everything. That's what makes their, their meat so delicious. Anybody here grilled some free range chicken and tasted it against industrial conventional chicken? It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Pasture raised eggs, this is what we want. We don't want this right there. That's cage free eggs. No, that's not good enough. We want grass fed milk. 100% grass-fed. I'd lay off the fat-free because that's been processed. It doesn't come fat-free from nature. 
We want it to back to be the way it is from nature. We want to trade our grains for grass-fed. We want 100% grass-fed beef, bison, dairy, pastured pork, free-range chicken, free-range eggs, free-range dairy, free-range turkey, wild-caught fish, raw milk. Raw milk is great for you if you can get it. And if you're as long as you don't have a, a reactivity to milk or dairy, Lucky Layla Farms right up here in Plano off of Jupiter Road is the best place to get raw milk. You have to buy it directly. In Texas, you have to buy it directly from a farm. You cannot get it in the store. But it is fabulous if you have leaky gut or immune problems. It's wonderful for you as long as you can tolerate milk. And so you want kefir, Greek and Bulgarian yogurts. Those are rich with biotics as long if you can handle dairy. What kind of healthy fats do we want? Everything we've been taught about fat and cholesterol is wrong. There is no science nor single study proving that a high fat diet causes heart disease. And saturated fat does not clog our arteries in spite of what we've been told all these years. And eating saturated fat does not raise our cholesterol. Watch these next scenes from Fathead the movie. If you could pack all of human history into one year, we've only been farming and eating grain since about yesterday, which is when we became shorter and fatter. We only started consuming processed vegetable oils about 10 minutes ago, which is when heart disease became our number one killer. So after examining all this human history, the experts came to the obvious conclusion. We need to eat a lot more of these. And so they convinced us that human health depends on foods we didn't eat for more than 99% of our entire existence. How did this happen? In the 1950s, a biochemist named Ansel Keys published a study that compared heart disease and fat consumption in a half dozen countries. The more fat, the more heart disease. The trend line was unmistakable. Just one little problem. Keys left out countries where people eat a lot of fat but have very little heart disease, like Holland and Norway. He also left out countries where people don't eat much fat but do have a lot of heart disease, like Chile. In fact, Keys had reliable data from 22 countries and the results were all over the place. But you can't make a big splash in the scientific community with a trend line that looks like this. So Keys did what any dedicated researcher would do. He threw out the data that didn't fit and published his results. His punishment for this bit of scientific chicanery was to get his picture on the cover of Time magazine. Keyes became known as the father of the lipid hypothesis, which says that eating saturated fat raises the cholesterol in your blood, and high cholesterol in your blood clogs your arteries and causes heart disease. The hypothesis that when you eat high fat, that then that produces high cholesterol, and the cholesterol produces heart disease, is wrong in every one of those links. This whole idea that dietary fat causes cholesterol problems is sort of a myth. The whole idea that uh, cholesterol problems lead to heart disease is a myth. The theory is completely and totally wrong. It was a, a theory that was made out of whole cloth and then pushed. The, the term artery clogging saturated fat, it's as though it's all one word. It's become part of the the zeitgeist, everybody knows saturated fat is bad for you, but when you get back and you start looking at the medical literature and you root back through to find out where this whole idea came from, it's bogus. Three authors who did root through the medical literature are science writer Gary Taubes, Swedish doctor Ufi Ravenskov, and British doctor Malcolm Kendrick. When they examined the data from all the big studies on heart disease, they discovered some pretty interesting facts. Here's my favorite. Guess how many studies actually prove that a high-fat diet causes heart disease? The answer? Zero. That's right. None. In some of the largest studies ever conducted, researchers put thousands of volunteers on a low-fat diet and then tracked their health history for several years. The results? Nothing. They had just as many heart attacks as people who weren't on a low-fat diet. Since 1948, the Harvard Medical School has been following the diets and death rates of the entire population of Framingham, Massachusetts. 
One of the researchers involved in the Framingham study called the lipid hypothesis the greatest scientific scam of this century, perhaps of any century. And after more than 40 years, even the director of the study made a rather startling admission about what the study data actually shows. The more saturated fat one ate, the more cholesterol one ate, the lower the person's serum cholesterol. In other words, a high-fat diet does not automatically raise your cholesterol. Everything we've been taught about cholesterol is wrong. Inflammation and oxidation in our arteries from elevated blood sugar, stress, and smoking cause heart disease. The truth is that cholesterol is vital for our body, brain, and heart's health and is there to repair each one of them. Think of cholesterol as the emergency responders putting out the fires of inflammation in our body and oxidation in our arteries. High cholesterol is a predictor of great health, not bad health regardless of what we've been taught. Watch these next scenes from Fathead. Well, what about the second half of the lipid hypothesis? Whether it comes from your diet or not, doesn't high cholesterol cause heart disease? After all, that's what the experts have been telling us for 50 years. Lots of people have bad heart attacks and have low cholesterol. There's not really a huge correlation there. You've got people who have heart attacks and who develop plaque who have high cholesterol, people who have low cholesterol. There's really not any correlation. Michael DeBakey, the famous heart surgeon, compared the medical records of more than 1,700 of his own patients. He found no relationship between cholesterol levels and heart disease. When Dwight Eisenhower had his first heart attack, his cholesterol was only about 165. Wow, that's a nice healthy level there, General. So if high cholesterol doesn't actually cause heart disease, what does? The newest theories in heart disease development don't have anything to do with cholesterol. They have to do with inflammation. Cholesterol does not cause heart disease. Cholesterol is the thing that heart disease acts upon. The, the heart disease is the inflammation and the oxidation, the placking out of cholesterol once it becomes uh, oxidized. So many people have been found that have low uh, normal or low cholesterol and they still have bad heart disease. But uh, most of those people, when, when they're checked carefully, will have signs of, of inflammation. To understand how inflammation can cause heart disease, let's look at what cholesterol actually does. Cholesterol is one of the most important substances in your body. Without it, you'd be dead. Your brain and your nervous system are full of cholesterol. The walls of your cells depend on cholesterol. Nearly all of your hormones are made from cholesterol. This stuff is so important, almost every cell in your body can make its own cholesterol if it has to. The heart disease story we all know goes like this. If you have too much LDL or bad cholesterol, it builds up in your arteries and makes them narrow. But if you're lucky, HDL or good cholesterol gobbles it up and clears it away. It's a nice simple story. And it's a load of baloney. For one thing, LDL and HDL are not cholesterol. They're proteins that carry cholesterol through your blood. LDL carries cholesterol from your liver to your tissues, and HDL carries old cholesterol back to your liver where it's recycled. If you want more HDL, the last thing you need is a low-fat diet. What makes HDL go up? Fat in the diet. That's what raises HDL. So you increase the fat in your diet, and your HDL, deemed by even the most fervent anti-cholesterol person as the good cholesterol, HDL goes up. That's right. In spite of what the experts told us, 27 different studies have shown that eating saturated fat raises your HDL. And despite its bad reputation, not all LDL is actually bad. LDL comes in different size packages. They're little small, dense, BB-like packages, and they're big, round, fluffy, cotton ball-like packages. And the small, dense ones, it turns out, what's called a type B uh, LDL, are the most harmful ones. And the big, fluffy ones aren't particularly harmful at all. Heart disease doesn't begin when your cholesterol goes up. It begins when your arteries become damaged or inflamed. LDL then does exactly what it's supposed to do. It brings in cholesterol to help the healing process. But if small LDL becomes damaged by oxidation, it can penetrate the wall of the artery. 
If the inflammation and oxidation continue, a plaque begins to form. Now you've got heart disease. So does a high-fat diet produce too much small LDL? Nope. Small LDL is the result of eating too many carbohydrates. That's been shown in the medical literature probably a dozen times at least in papers that reducing carbohydrate in the diet shifts from a small dense pattern to a big fluffy pattern. Having an LDL that's 120 or 130 or 100 or 145 doesn't matter as much as the kind of LDL that it is. If the numbers alone don't mean very much, then why does high cholesterol get all the blame? Research consistently shows that smoking, elevated blood sugar, and emotional stress can cause inflammation, damage your arteries, and lead to heart disease. They also happen to raise your cholesterol. So by blaming cholesterol for causing heart disease, the experts relied on logic that makes about as much sense as this. In high crime areas, there are more calls to the police. Therefore, we can assume that calling the police produces an increase in crime. To get rid of crime, the answer is simple. Stop calling the police. But in spite of all the evidence that cholesterol is just an innocent bystander, the experts keep trying to bring it up on charges. In 1988, the Surgeon General's office set out to prove the lipid hypothesis by reviewing the data from all the major studies. But after 11 years and more than $100 million, the results were not supporting the theory. So they did what any dedicated government researchers would do. They shut down the entire project, saying it was becoming too complicated. In the 1980s, the National Cholesterol Education Program released new guidelines that said everyone's cholesterol should be below 200, which was about 20 points below normal. And here's a strange coincidence. Most of the scientists who wrote those guidelines just happen to have a financial relationship with the companies that make cholesterol-lowering drugs called statins. Many of the studies that claimed a low-fat diet is good for your heart were funded by the American Heart Association, which earns millions of dollars licensing its heart check logo to healthy low-fat foods like Cocoa Puffs. If the lipid hypothesis ever goes away, that logo just became worthless. Give this another uh, decade and that hypothesis will be on the junk pile of history because it's not true. Okay, so maybe the lipid hypothesis isn't true. So what? What could possibly be wrong with cutting back on saturated fat and getting your cholesterol as low as possible? We now have this terrible phobia of fat, of animal fat, which the body needs to be normal, to be healthy. Your immune system is fat dependent, I mean, your brain is fat dependent, your skin, your hair, your nails, all these things are fat dependent. Your, your sex hormones are fat dependent, are cholesterol dependent, they're made sort of on a cholesterol molecule. If you are elderly, over the age of 60, and if you're a woman of any age, the cholesterol is a complete non-issue. In fact, the higher your cholesterol, the longer you live. And this is, shows up in study after study. And yet, in spite of those studies, drugs that lower cholesterol are being marketed to women. But take a good look at that little disclaimer. If it doesn't prevent heart disease, why on earth would you take such a powerful drug? There is absolutely no benefit for women of any age in taking statins. I mean, statins are a waste of money for women. There's some real problems with taking statins. Memory loss, muscle problems. And osteoporosis in women. I mean, there are a lot of reasons that you wouldn't want to take statin drugs. And low cholesterol is a predictor for depression, suicide, violent behavior, strokes, and cancer. It's much better to have high cholesterol than lower cholesterol. This is Dr. Kate Shanahan's webpage. This is her front page of her webpage. Cholesterol pills can put your brain at risk. Your brain needs cholesterol. Do you see that? And what does it say over here? Statins? Statins reduce your cholesterol? So this is what she is talking about, is that statins are really bad for us. They inhibit cholesterol going to our brain where that impairs brain growth. Notice what we have right here. And this comes from grain brain. The traditional diets, our ancestors' diets, was 75% fat, about 5% carbs, and about 20% protein. That's how we got here. That's how we grew a big brain. That's how we got so smart. That's how our civilization developed. 
But here's what our, the dietary recommendations from US experts are right here. 60% carbohydrates, 20% fat, 20% protein. Is there any wonder why things could be going wrong in our bodies? Fat and cholesterol are good for you. It's a book by Uwe Rosenskopf. He was one of the first people to go in and study this and to look at all the data and show that it's absolutely bogus what we have bought into about fat and cholesterol being bad for us when they're actually really good for us, as long as they come from the really good sources. Everybody talks about the Spanish diet being so healthy for us. I know a lot about that. I lived in Spain. This is what we eat in Spain. A lot of meat, every meal will have some clean protein in it. That's the way they eat there. We eat a lot of vegetables. This is the Spanish diet. High in clean saturated fat, clean cheese, which is manchego. There's clean protein at every meal. A lot of fresh vegetables, salads, fresh fruits. But here's the key. It's not only high in fat and high in protein, it's low in sugar, no processed food at all in it, no salt, no corn in the diet, and we always eat at home, never eat out. I mean, this is the way we live in Spain. That's how I live with them. Jan and I are going there in just six weeks again to be with my Spanish mother for her birthday. And this is the diet I just took for granted. And every time we go there, we just come back skinnier, healthier, just eating all this good, yummy fat. There's our favorite olive oil that tastes like Spanish olive oil, Calavita. It's expensive, but it tastes like what we get in Europe. So you want as much water as you possibly can drink. It's just good, good, good for you. Some people have reaction to coffee, uh, some people don't. But water is great for our digestion. We need it to flush our system out. Just drink mucho water. Something else, you can take or leave this. This can be personal. I know it works for me better than it does for Janet. But we do both do this one thing that works very well for both of us, and it's called intermittent fasting. And intermittent fasting, is a way I lived for most of my life, particularly all my competitive athletic career, and I didn't know it was intermittent fasting. I just only ate when I was hungry, okay? And there was a lot of fat and protein, so I was really never that hungry. But fasting can be really good because your body self-repairs when you fast, when you give it a break from food. What you can try, see if you like, this is what really works great for me, is I eat in an eight-hour window. I give my body every day 16 hours a break from food and eat in an eight hour window. Me personally, I love dinner. So I'd rather have, eat from 12 to eight if I want something like it. Some people want breakfast, fine. Start, eat your breakfast. Eat in an eight hour window. Give your body, what, 16 hours a break from food. When you start eating this way, you're not gonna be as hungry. And you, what happens, your body will find its own natural weight. You'll, you don't have to diet. You don't have to count calories. You just start eating the clean foods and you just do something where you give your body a chance to assimilate and digest and eliminate that food. And there's, there's many people talk about intermittent fasting being the next thing in nutrition is going really big, is giving your body a break from food. If you cut out the carbohydrates, you're not gonna be eating as much. And exercise, big one. This is great for the body and the brain. It doesn't matter how you do it, doesn't matter when you do it, just however, whenever, move your body. The more you do it, the better. Uh, it's great for our brain health, it's great for reducing inflammation. There's so many things, we're not going into the exercise here. This is the chart that Janet and I live by. We created this just so we would know how to navigate this food jungle, this food thing that's going on to make it simple for us. I needed it for me to simplify everything that we were learning. That's how we do our office work right there. That's our treadmill desk. Janet has one and I have one and we do all our computer work just kind of walking or standing if we don't want to walk. It's just staying in motion, staying in movement. This is where we shop. Our number one place to shop is right here at Natural Grocers. It's the one place where it's all organic produce and they have the clean meats. Everything in the store is safe. U.S. Wellness Meats, if you want to find uh, a source for grass-fed if you can't buy it someplace, uswellnessmeats.com. This is where we buy it. We have it shipped to our door two days after we have an order, 100% grass-fed, absolutely fabulous medicine. Just remember, whatever is in our food is going to be in us. And that's what we want to do is put the cleanest 
fuel and medicine that we can in our body. We don't want to be eating fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides and antibiotics and growth hormones, GMOs or frankenfoods. We want to eliminate that. We want to change all of this. And the way we can do it is through demand. We quit buying the products, we quit eating it, it will change everything. We can turn this whole food system around and we need to go ask our butcher to start carrying grass-fed beef. We want to demand labeling of GMOs. So what have we learned today? First of all, that all calories are not equal. It's not just about dividing out carbs, proteins, and fats, demonizing some, exalting others. No, it's really learning to divide the food pyramid straight down the middle and separating the toxic food from the clean food. That means the toxic carbs, proteins, and fats from the clean carbs, proteins, and fat. We have to know the difference between those. Cheap food is very expensive. We cannot afford the luxury of cheap food because it costs us too much in the long run with our health. We can't exercise our way out of a bad diet. We have to get our diet right. There is not enough exercise that you can possibly do to correct eating bad. And that the proper relationship between food and exercise for our health is that it's 80% food and 20% exercise. And when you put the two together, we discover the magic pill of clean food and exercise, which become our daily best medicines. And they help us overcome the negative impact of stress in our life, the positive and negative emotions, which cause emotional eating in our life, the lack of quality sleep or any negative impact from the environment. And that we have to balance all of our life for optimum health and that we ingest and digest our whole life. And because of that, what we need for our health is clean air, clean water, clean soil, and clean food. Sugar and processed carbs make us fat and cause our epidemic diseases, and that's what we want to eliminate from our diet, the sugar and the processed carbs. We are evolutionarily designed to eat clean meat and saturated fat. Cholesterol is vital to our body and brain and does not cause heart disease. Our heart actually needs cholesterol. It does not damage our heart. It actually helps repair the inflammation and the oxidation in our arteries. What else? Our body is a hybrid car. That means we can either burn carbohydrates or we can burn fat. And clean fat is our body, our brain, and our heart's best fuel source. So what we really want to do is eat what we are. And what are we? We are fat and we are protein. Now we can run on carbs, but we got to have make sure it's really good, high quality, slow carbs. And then we're eating our meds and our vitamins by all those fresh, colorful vegetables that you can eat. All of them. You just don't want processed ones. You don't want packaged ones. You don't want prepared ones. You want to prepare it yourself because why? You and I will be saved by our own pots, pans, oven, and grill. We have to cook for ourselves. We cannot trust anybody else, any place else, to cook with as high quality or care about our health as much as we will. Now, the low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet is killing us. We're nutritionally anemic and starved for quality fat. Low-fat products, ironically, make us fat. Sugar and processed carbs make us fat, sick, and addicted. And being fat and having elevated blood sugar causes inflammation, and that is the beginning of most diseases. So how do we become a fat-burning machine? By what we put on our fork. We have to keep our blood sugar and our insulin down in order to burn fat. And then we burn fat 24 hours a day but we have to reduce the sugar and the carbohydrates that become sugar and their biggest offender of that are processed carbohydrates and grains. Then the second part is we've got to increase clean saturated fat in our diet. We need fat to burn fat. And everything I've talked about here is open-ended. Just let this be a starting point for you in your journey to regaining health through eating clean. As you learn more, you can add, you can subtract anything from this to make it work for you because everybody has a body that has different needs. You are the expert of your body by listening to it and learning what works for it, what doesn't. We've always heard that knowledge is power. Well, I just don't believe that's true at all because it's how we implement that knowledge that makes the difference, whether it's powerful or none at all. 
So better stated is applied knowledge is power. Now we come back full circle to where we started with what Hippocrates told us a long time ago, the father of medicine. Let thy food be thy medicine and thy medicine be thy food. And the perfect corollary to that, updating it, is what Dr. Linus Pauling said in 1960. Optimum nutrition is the medicine of tomorrow. Now for me, optimum nutrition looks like everything we've talked about today. It's about being a clean fooditarian. That's it, a clean fooditarian. Eat clean food only. What does that look like? That is eliminating toxic carbs, fats, and proteins, and increasing the clean fats, the clean proteins, and the clean carbs. And what does that look like? Well, it looks like our eat clean, get healthy chart that we built today. And where we have on the left-hand side, the orange side, is all of the toxic foods, which I call the toxic feedlot to hospital model. Those are the ones we want to avoid of sugar processed foods, GMOs, grains, industrial proteins, and fats. Those do not need to be in our body because they're highly toxic to us. And what we do want is embrace everything on that green pyramid on the right hand side. It's the healthy body fuel and meds. And that is the colorful fresh vegetables and fruits, the 100% natural grass protein, which means 100% grass fed beef, pastured pork, free range chicken. You want free range eggs. You want free range dairy. We need the healthy fats from olives and avocados and nuts. Coconut oil is absolutely magical. 100% grass-fed cow butter. Yum, yum. All of the fats that come from the 100% natural protein are good for us, healthy for us, and medicinal for us. And we want to drink all the water we possibly can, fast ever so often, maybe eat in an 8 to 10 hour window every day. That becomes a fast of giving your body a break to digest everything. And that is a very powerful way to eat and live. And then certainly exercise for your body and your brain's health and exercise whenever, however you can. Just whatever you enjoy doing, what's fun for you, do that. Just keep your body in motion. We have to know the source of our food. We have to know what foods are toxic and what foods are clean for our body. We have to know what foods inflame us and which ones don't. Because what's inside your food will be in you. We eat what our food has been treated with or what it ate. And that's why I say you are what your food ate. You can download the Eat Clean, Get Healthy chart at youarewhatyourfoodate.com or at jimmylangkop.com. A very special thank you to my fabulous soulmate wife, Janet, for all of her inspiration, research, and help, and our journey in putting together this video on You Are What Your Food Ate, Everything We've Been Taught About Healthy Eating is Wrong. A very special thank you to Tom Naughton for making the fabulous movie Fathead, to the people at the Institute for Responsible Nutrition for making Sugar is Killing Us, Fred Water Producer, and to Dr. Mark Hyman, Dr. Robert Lustig, Dr. William Davis, Dr. David Perlmutter, Dr. Kate Shanahan, Dr. Thomas O'Brien, Dr. Mimin Oz, Dr. Michael Eads, Dr. Mary Dan Eads, to Sean Croxton of Underground Wellness, Jeffrey Smith at the Institute for Responsible Technology, Gary Taubes, and to John Wood of U.S. Wellness Meets. Video by BlackOliveMedia.com, Dallas, Texas, Jason Van Sickle. Background melody by Richard Gasprin. Written, edited, and produced by me, Jimmy Langkop. Shot February 16th, 2014 at Unity of Dallas. For more information on this program and future programs, go to JimmyLangkop.com. Thank you for watching.